may i present to you our alumni and the best in this field mr abhinav anantharaman before yeah. i go thank you ahead, thank you so much yeah okay uh, before i go ahead here are few instructions to all the participants also requesting you all to note down your queries in the chat box we will be addressing them at the end of this session i would request all to fill the feedback form at the end in order to avail the certificate the link for all the above will be provided in the chat section now without any further ado i would like to call upon our today's speaker mr abhinav anantharaman and ask him to continue with the event yeah thank you thank you so much abhilasha it is it is a very 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 warm welcome for me and uh, yeah so good morning everyone and uh, so i'll so I, even i'll give a quick introduction about myself okay so uh, yeah i started my career in biomedical engineering from vidya lanka so i was uh, just like everyone else over here so i was a student of vidya lanka institute of technology and yes so during my course or during my engineering i started learning robotics i started getting into robotics as a field okay so that is how i uh, pursued robotics from like from 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 the college days and then after that i went into organizations where i completely worked on robotics and automation systems so like abhilasha said uh, control firmware programming which is actually called microcontroller programming and software programming as well as developing hardware like electronics developing pcbs that is what i do that is my core uh, skills and uh, yeah so and i mean that's it, that's it from for for about my introduction and thank you everyone thank you everyone for coming today and i'm really looking forward to have a very good uh, time with you guys so so i'll i'll go ahead and start yeah yes sir yes okay so uh, abhilash just before that uh, can you can you just let me know uh, what 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 are like uh, which which students are here actually so i mean is it people from first year second year or mostly or majorly from third year it is mix so and there are people okay. from outside the institution also okay okay that is great so uh so i would want to know from the crowd is anyone actually working in robotics right now because uh, or they want i mean so what 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 is the expectations here from everyone so i just want to know a quick expectation from some people so any any outsider can actually go ahead and let me know so what 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 is it you want to take away from this seminar is there anyone who would like to share okay okay no problem so i'll go ahead and let you guys know what i am actually have planned for everyone here so uh, since uh, i got to know that Abhita. this yeah yeah sorry to interrupt yeah, uh, yeah. we have friends from second year and third year mostly so okay. they are new about uh, robotics i mean they don't have the subject yes. right now right okay yeah. so yeah so i actually had heard this from the one who was organizing the seminar so yeah so what i planned for this seminar was uh, actually giving you a brief introduction on uh, what is robotics what is the field currently looking at what are the things that are currently happening in the world of robotics right now and if as a beginner you want to get into robotics what 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 is the right step you have to take so that is how i've made my presentation and also at the end of the lecture we will we would be having actually a uh, Uh, I mean, a quick uh, practical session on something. Uh, I'll let you know what is that. So, so I don't think this is purely going to be a seminar where I'm just keeping on talking like theoretical, but there'll also be some practical knowledge which I'll share with you guys. So, yeah, I'll get you guys started. So, yes. so like the, like the topic clearly suggests so it is about introduction to robotics with a framework or a software 
called as robot operating system. So that is what we're going to look at in the entire seminar today. OK. So yeah, can anyone in the crowd you know, please let me know what what is robotics? Is there anyone who wants to come up and speak like what is what is robotics? What 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 is robotics for you? What have you guys seen or learned till now? Anyone? Let's let's make this a little uh, uh, I mean two way communication so that I actually can understand what kind of things you want to learn and what what is your expectation? So anyone, anyone of you? OK, <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, so like the name suggests, actually robotics is basically an intersection of science, engineering and technology. So what do you mean by that? So when when uh, actually Abhilasha gave my introduction to you guys, so it was more about a mixture of a lot of things which I've learned. So you can since most of you guys are from biomedical background, it is actually one of the best uh, field I would say for I mean for robotics. So there are many institutions around the world which has biomedical as a core uh, subject and robotics as a sidekick. Yeah. So and why is that? Because this is because robotics as a subject needs you to learn programming, needs you to learn electronics, basics of hardware, and a lot of mechanical engineering as well. So when you want to create a robot from scratch, say any robot for the matter, you have to have at least 20 to 30 percent of knowledge of each of these subjects before you go ahead and do something. Right, so robotics is basically that field which actually gets all these subjects together and makes you learn how do you create your first robot or how do you make a machine which is autonomous and uh, like and then and, and it can do whatever you want it to do, right? So by that, what is a robot? So a robot is a product is the outcome of what your knowledge or the in each of these engineering fields you put together uh, is that is the outcome of or the product which you get. So any any robot can be described as something that can help everyone, say assist humans or mimic some human actions or any kind of thing. So Robots were originally, originally built to handle uh, monotonous tasks. Like, for for instance, uh, some people can even define robot uh, like a washing machine as a robot. So, yes, it is like it, it is, it's an autonomous system which can you know uh, wash your clothes without you having to keep giving inputs again and again and again or do something manually in it. So even that is an autonomous system which can actually wash your clothes. So. A robot can be anything, any system uh, which runs autonomously, which has its own brain. And by by the meaning of brain, it doesn't have to be AI or machine learning. By brain, it can be any any monotonous task which is being programmed into the robot, which is to, which it has to do on a regular basis or on a, a real time basis. And that's it. That 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 again, it's an autonomous system which can be called a robot. So. Yes, so moving ahead uh, when I say robot, sorry. so yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, sure, sure, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, I would love that, yeah. If anyone wants to add, answer, uh, please raise your hands uh, so that we can access your mic. Oh, That's yeah. it, sir. You can continue. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, no problem, no problem. Thank you. Uh, yes, so when you talk about robots, so there are the different types of robots which actually exist. So I can actually start classifying robots on different bases. So what, what are the different types of robots we have? Let's see. So on a general classification, so based on a general classification, the first one which we have is pre-programmed robots. So a pre-programmed robot is exactly what I said before. So it can be a robotic arm can be a washing machine, it can be uh, any autonomous system which uh, is programmed to do a particular task. So it doesn't have to get out of that environment. It doesn't have to be in a new environment or it doesn't have to get a new task which has to be programmed in it again. So the programming is fixed. 
and the mechanical and the electrical electronic assembly is fixed. This is what it has to do. This is what the hardware is. So a, a robotic hand or a robotic arm, which does a pick and place operation in any kind of a, uh, industrial environment, say in case of uh, a warehouse where, uh, I mean, the chases of a car is being manufactured, right? So the process of welding can be done by a robotic arm. The process of fixing or like nuts and bolts or screwing something, that is again uh, a task which is uh, programmed into a robotic arm. So these tasks are very much fixed. So it's like a monoton monotonous task. It has to do it like on a regular basis and it keeps doing it again and again and again. It's just like a fixed loop which keeps going on, right? That is like a pre-programmed robot. Humanoid robots again. So this these are uh, like the new age robots which are uh, <laughs> which are more into this field right now, uh, if you say. So has anyone uh, seen a humanoid robot like way before? Can anyone tell me a humanoid robot which you know from from childhood? Is there is there any such robot which you know from childhood? Hi, anyone? Okay, okay. So, yes, yeah, so humanoid robots, which uh, the first humanoid robot for me was uh, actually C3PO, the one uh, uh, which you've seen in Star Wars, right? That has been the inspiration for many uh, uh, robotics companies or robotics industries to develop or enthusiasts to develop a humanoid robot. So, so today we have like a lot of human robots being developed or uh, being uh, manufactured all around the world. Uh, in fact, there are many organizations in India which have, who have actually started uh, programming or developing human robots for uh, assistance and for uh, places where it can actually uh, guide uh, people, say in kind of a seminar hall, in kind of an exhibition, uh, something like that. So yeah, so a human robot is basically anything that can mimic human actions. So it can actually walk like a human can they move its arms like what we do. So obviously there are a lot of restrictions which uh, come up when you're designing uh, the mechanical uh, framework for uh, human robots. But over the years of uh, uh, study and evolution in robotics. Uh, there are many universities and students in universities who have actually uh, tried to mimic the exact same movement of a human uh, of a human arm. So I mean, it is actually developing every day, and then maybe someday later it will actually be better than what we <laughs> do. So that is how it's being evolving. So uh, I think Atlas is one robot which uh, everyone might be knowing. Uh, which which has a human robot. So yeah, uh, augmenting robot. So augmenting robot is a very good field. It's very it's, it's it's actually one of the fields which I started working in when I was in biomedical. So this is this is one field uh, of robotics that actually might interest everyone from the biomedical engineering field a lot. So in my final year project, uh, me and my uh, uh, like uh, my, co my colleagues, we went ahead and uh, we made sure that we had to do something in robotics. So that was our aim. And how do you integrate robotics into medical field? So that was the time where a lot of uh, people were actually working on making uh, uh, an automated or uh, a remote or a remote controlled uh, chair. It's like uh, a remote controlled wheelchair. Sorry for for anyone who is uh, uh, I mean who has who doesn't have uh, like an access to a, any other technology right so so it's, it's very simple for someone who cannot walk to just sit on a chair and he can control it by himself so that was the thing which was uh, uh, like studied a lot in that period but then what we did is we went ahead and uh, we took it one step forward so by augmenting robotics or uh, augmenting robots it is it can be described by anything that actually fits on your body as an external uh, chassis or an external uh, cover and makes you 
uh, makes uh, you do things that are not actually possible for you at the current moment. So one of one such one such uh, problem with many people is they after after undergoing say a major accident or any any major incident in their life, they actually lose uh, their uh, I mean uh, uh, ability to walk. So this is because of say a nervous damage uh, damage done to the nerves in the spinal cord because of which there is no motor action being performed in say any of the limbs. So it, it can be a leg, it can be an arm, anything. So because of that, they are not able to walk. So the brain is sending the signals to the spinal cord and from that spinal cord, it's not being transmitted into your motor nerves or into your muscles. So how do you solve this problem? So the simplest way is giving a backpack where which has a brain okay a backpack which say i have a computing system in my backpack which a person can wear and i have an entire skeleton a robotic exoskeleton uh, okay like a like an iron man suit which just fits on your body and then with the help of motorized action i can actually control myself i can actually pick myself up or pick my arm up or pick my legs limbs up and then I can actually start walking or mimicking a walking action. So this is what augmenting robotics is. So this was one of the projects which we had explored, uh, which is called the exoskeleton for robotic, I um, mean, for human limbs. So yeah, that is about your augmented robotics. And so the next one we have is uh, teleoperated robots. So uh, has, has anyone uh, seen a teleoperated robot before? So why why teleoperated robot? I'll explain you first. A teleoperated robot is anything that can be controlled uh, from a safe distance or from anywhere around the world. So I can sit in India. I can control a robot which is there in say uh, Japan. I can actually do that. I can uh, <clears throat> see what the robot is doing. I can I have a live feedback of what the robot is doing, and I'm controlling everything of the robot sitting over here. So one of the most famous and the most widely used robot in medical field is, is, is a surgical robot. So that is one robot which evolved actually. So the industry of the medical industry uh, with respect to automation. So does anyone know what that robot is? I think uh, many of you, you might have even seen it in a field visit or something like that. So or might have heard it before. So does anyone know any such surgical robot which in in biomedical or medical field? Anyone? I mean, you can go ahead and answer. I think nobody has to be so quiet. So it becomes like a monotonous talk for me. So. Let, let us make this a little bit interesting. So you can keep asking me questions or you can su keep suggesting some robots. So that is how even I can actually tell everyone else. So I can get to know how much you know about robotics. So just anyone. So I can see a person called Gaurav, Gaurav Pawar. So can you tell me what, what any, any teleoperated robot which you have seen before? Hi so, Gaurav, you there? So Shruti has typed her answer in the chat. Okay, just a second. Perfect. Yeah, that's Da Vinci. So thank you, Shruti, so much. Thank you so much for doing this. So uh, Shruti, uh, you can actually turn on your mic. I mean, someone can give her permission. So instead of typing on the chat, we can actually have let I mean I I want to get to know like what what have you seen in it. So can you can you explain what 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 did you see in Da Vinci robot? Uh, Sir, I haven't seen it personally, but I have heard okay. about it. Okay. So uh, okay. So when what what did you hear about that robot actually? What what does it actually do? So it can be operated like um, mm -hmm. a person can operate it from a distance. Like the robot itself performs the surgery and someone else mm -hmm. can control it. Yeah, 
perfect so yeah so that is how uh, davinci robot was created so basically uh, it has two system uh, a, a control system which can be kept anywhere in the world so any doctor who has enough experience in controlling a uh, davinci robot or enough uh, is a very vast experience in surgeries can actually sit uh, have that uh, control unit uh, in his uh, location and the main surgery robot will be placed in the hospital so he if he is not available or if he is not able to travel to that location for that surgery and it is, it is a very critical uh, surgery which has to be performed say in a limited time then he can actually use that robot so to help that surgery be done being done and he has every feedback uh, and also so the control panel of uh, da vinci robot has a very unique feature so it actually gives you a tactile uh, feedback as well so though when when he's performing a surgery so the amount of pressure he is applying while makes he doing some stitches or while trying to clip something or remove something so it has different tools so da vinci has different tools uh, and it has around four arms uh, attached to it so you can actually attach four different tools on four different arms and you can control each arm separately is safe one for just picking up something one for cutting something one for just doing the stitches so so that's how you can actually operate and it's it's very easy to operate that anyone can uh, operate it if you know, obviously if you know surgery how to perform surgeries and it's very easy to operate da vinci robot and uh, the most uh, unique feature of that uh, robot is that after every say four or five surgeries uh, the tool which is being used uh, for the surgery has to be replaced uh, the robot actually uh, stops functioning it locks everything you cannot go in and uh, change any code or change any access rights you have to change the tool once the tool setup is done again that is when the robot uh, comes online again and you can do more surgeries yes uh, okay so yeah someone asked me is jcb used in construction of robot you can uh, call it not a robot basically uh, but uh, i mean an automobile like a vehicle right so yeah it does have motors it does have hydraulic system which uh, can which are used to basically pick up things or place things somewhere uh, but yeah it is like very much controlled right it is it is not something which is autonomous on a particular part you cannot have any part of the jcb to be autonomous you cannot do that so it is more, it is majorly operated manually right so that that cannot be called as a robot a robot should have at least 50% of something which is autonomous and 50% as an input like a manual input okay yeah so moving ahead yes the last part which we have is the autonomous robot so this actually uh, cannot be described as a uh, uh, i mean a way of uh, describing or uh, uh, describing a robot or classifying a robot this is like a very uh, natural thing a robot should have so any any robot which has a very uh, which is like a 100% autonomous robot which doesn't have to have any human input so uh, so one one such robot which you can uh, think of or which i can tell you is uh, an agv uh, an autonomous guided vehicle okay so in that what what happens is that uh, the robot is programmed uh, to adopt any environment so where do you use agvs uh, okay can can anyone tell me anyone has seen an agv or uh, like can anyone has any uh, seen an agv like before you can just type in in the chat and so uh agv is like the most booming field right now in in robotics and many 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 uh, manufacturing and uh, uh, what do you say uh, like industries which have like amazon and uh, flipkart or uh, mintra which have logistics as the largest uh, or the major part of their industry are are adopt, adopting or are buying robots from different uh, organizations in india which make uh, yes who is it? darshana darshana has said uh, production line robots exactly so so agvs are basically yeah those which can be helped in any kind of a industrial environment to say uh, move a particular product or a material from one point to another point in the factory 
and this can be done autonomously and in a fixed uh, way. So it's like say on a daily basis, uh, I know that there's a rack A in some room B of uh, or of an industry, and I have to move it to say room Y, uh, and this has to be done on a very regular basis. So. But the problem here is that an industry does should like will not have the same kind of an environment every day. So there can be 100 people in that uh, entire area for the first day. In the second day, there can be no one. For the third day, there can be 50 more people. You never know. And also, there are certain things or certain racks or shells or anything or, or any machineries that are being placed on a particular place in the industry and then being removed or shifted. So this robot now. I, if I if I program this robot, I it shouldn't happen that I have to keep programming it again and again and again on a daily basis. So that is not that is not feasible, right? So say if today there were there, there were no obstacles at all in the path of the robot, say for transporting same material X from A to B position, but tomorrow there are hundred obstacles in in the same way inside the industry. So is it is it feasible for anyone to like actually go ahead and program it again and say, OK, the obstacle is in point X1, Y1. The second obstacle is in point X2, Y2. OK, now or say on a real time basis that in the morning it was some the obstacle was in X position and uh, in in the afternoon it has been shifted to X dash. So how will the robot keep changing or how will the robot keep learning about the environment? So that is where the autonomous com concept or the AI or the machine learning part comes into picture. So what do we do is we have sensors integrated into the robots. Say we have depth sensors like camera, which can actually have 3D vision. By, by meaning 3D vision, what does what it actually means is that an image, say a 2D image, taken uh, at a particular FPS. At the same time, I get to know what is the distance of that 2D image which I just captured. Uh, so basically, I can see any particular object. What is the distance of that object in that particular image? So that is what is called a 3D image or a 3D depth camera, which captures that image. Okay, so I can have 3D sensors. I can have ultrasonic sensors, which gives me distance. I can have IR sensors, say, which gives me if there's an obstacle in front of me, yes or no, like a digital zero or a one, yes or no kind of sensor. Uh, I have LiDAR, which keeps continuously mapping an entire room on a regular basis. So what I can do is that I can actually make program for the robot in a way that it if I give a point A as a starting point and point B as the uh, target point. It knows how to go. I don't have to program it again and again, so it knows on an autonomous way how it can travel from A to B. So that is where the autonomous com uh, part comes into picture. So when I, when, when I previously said that any uh, any robot which does things automatically or you don't have to give manual inputs, that is one part and autonomous when it comes to AI and machine learning, when you take it one step ahead or further where it can actually even sense the environment autonomously, it, it can be put into new environment on a daily basis. It, you don't have to again reprogram it. That is where it takes the robot like one step further. Yeah. OK, so the final one which we can see is based on the application. So based on applications, we can have different kinds of robots like industrial robots, domestic robots. Domestic robots can be any robot which helps you in on a, on a daily course, like uh, say a cleaning robot uh, or, uh, or a dishwasher machine. Like uh, it, it can actually just wash your dishes and I mean, help you out. Surgical robots, which like I said, uh, one of them is Da Vinci. Uh, Another one is Robonauts. So Robonauts are basically uh, those robots which are actually being manufactured or uh, developed right now uh, for space exploration. So in, in case of uh, conditions or uh, like environments where it's not ideal for uh, human beings to know, keep uh, going or like say be there for a longer period of time, then what we use is something called as Robonauts. So, I mean, the robot can do my job, right? It can again, the robot can be anything. It can be a wheeled robot which actually moves around places. It can be a humanoid robot, okay, which helps in the spaceship to pick up something, to place something somewhere, to guide something, or to like, you no, know, to uh, have a lot of uh, uh, in-depth knowledge of the entire spaceship. You no, know, letting letting people know what what actually is where, and you can ask questions to the robot. Some something that way. 
uh commercial entertainment one of the booming fields right now uh, they can you might have already seen a lot of robots or specifically even robots which are uh, being used for different exhibitions or seminars uh, in in very uh, you know, like uh, on, on, on a regular basis to basically uh, say you can i can ask questions to it and it can actually give you answers so those kind of robots so one such robot or one such uh, application was also developed uh, by me and my team uh, in in my previous company so yeah army robots again uh, something which can actually uh, uh, like so you can you, you might have seen aerial uh, vehicles aerial autonomous vehicles right so like drones or uh, or any any other flying object like uh, which can, like a drone can be like a plane kind of a drone or an rc plane or a quadcopter as well so that which actually uh, helps you uh, to understand uh, the environment on a on, on a very uh, uh, like say say in can in case of uh, places where it is difficult for army men to actually go and see what is happening or if they want to actually get a very uh, broad perspective of the entire area it so you can use avs or uh, robots which can actually go on the ground and travel and see what what is happening everywhere so that is one army robot and the last one is obviously service robot uh, like i said uh, any agv can be used as a service robot okay so yes just a second So uh yeah I mean Okay so the actual uh, uh I mean use of that video was uh, to let you guys know like what 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 are we going to do today okay So I've I've told you about enough of about robotics right so i've told you like what what kind of robots uh, are available in the market what what robotics is what is a robot and everything so i know you guys don't have that question so you have already seen a lot of robots you've already come across uh, many kind of applications uh, where robotics is used as a major thing right your question today is not what is a robot so your question today is where do i start so if i want to learn robotics if i want to do something in this field where do i start so has anyone as a big now right now i've already uh, say started working on something started learning something uh, in the field of robotics can can anyone tell me if they've already started doing something on on the chat so you can take a minute and you can actually think of something that you've already started or you started learning robotics and you didn't understand what 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 is going on so is there anyone like that uh no nobody has actually worked in robotics completely before okay uh yeah darshan okay you were working on inverse kinematics for a physiotherapy instrument okay okay it was really very good very good that that's good so what what were you actually doing on that and what were the problems you faced as a beginner when you have no idea about what what where do i start so what what, what was it you can actually go ahead and turn on your mic and explain to sure. uh yeah sorry no yeah uh, yeah so yeah. actually the main issue was understanding the um, methodology mm -hmm. because it okay. was a physiotherapy instrument and actually being a rehabilitation device we were about to use it for a large range of population right so for yeah. every uh, like the mechanism which we were using we were not able mm -hmm. to incorporate it using uh, matlab and that's where ross came in but then i was not able to use ross at the initial level okay okay perfect so like this is what i actually wanted to know so 
yes so like darshana said there are many people like in you know, thousands and thousands of people who want to learn robotics who want to get into the robotics but when they actually start working in it when they have a goal they have a start they have a goal okay but you don't know what is there in between you don't you know the starting point you know the end goal you know uh, on a theoretical basis what you are like say for physiotherapy she was making something and she was designing inverse kinematics so she understands inverse kinematics she knows mathematics she knows the algorithm uh, she knows if i give uh, x y it will give me what is a theta that is inverse kinematics so by meaning of inverse kinematics to everyone else who doesn't know say uh, consider a robotic arm okay uh, any any robotic arm which has uh, like, like so just a joint in the elbow which has a motor in the shoulder okay so like just like you have you can actually rotate your hand and, you know from 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 the shoulder joint you can actually have three axes of rotation from the elbow again you can have three axes of rotation so what what actually uh, so how how do you actually make the robot move so you can actually feed angles theta to your uh, motors which take care of these three uh, uh, i mean uh, axes of rotation so you can actually give theta to it that is called forward kinematics so when you give theta the robot end point the end point or the tip of your say if you consider ha- my hand then the tip of my finger is like the final point of the hand so based on the angle which i'm trying to move i can see where my tip will go right so the same way the same way a robotic arms end point or the tool is what you call uh, the position of the robot so when i give theta it will move to some point and it will tell me okay this is the final position so that is called forward kinematics you give theta you get xy but in case of inverse inverse kinematics which is most widely used because i know the xy i always know the xy because i know i want to pick something from x1 y1 and place something into x2 y2 i always know the final and the uh, initial destination i mean coordinates but i don't know the theta so that is where you calculate inverse kinematics you do you have uh, as x y as the input and you have theta as the output for each joint so theta 1 for the shoulder theta 2 for the elbow theta 3 say for uh, your wrist joint if you have so that is what inverse kinematics so when darshana was actually working on inverse kinematics she use the most widely used tool which is matlab so matlab for a math and a computation problem is the best right so matlab themselves actually have a lot of uh, robot framework they do have uh, uh, many kind of uh, robotic algorithms which you can simulate in matlab as well so she was using matlab and uh, she was uh, trying to f- figure out the inverse kinematic issue but after a point maybe say say darshana didn't have a scope to like do a 3d modeling so she doesn't know how do i model my robot i cannot make my robot right away because i don't have the uh, i mean uh, components or the uh, mechanical parts needed for that but i have to do it i have to find a way to like you know make this robot so so for those sitting here today who understand robotics say to some part but you don't know where do i start like which is that particular thing that can get me started so for that say let's let's make some assumptions here okay so let's say that you have a good knowledge of any widely used programming language so like c++ you know c++ you are you, you know at least 50% or 30% of c++ and you can learn more the moment you start coding so the moment you start so any any programming language doesn't actually uh, i mean you cannot learn it just by understanding it you have to keep programming you have to get errors you have to solve those errors and that is where you actually learn so let's consider that you are not a pro of any programming language but you know at least 20% or 30% of that programming language say you have you know c++ or you know python or you know one of the most widely used right now which is java perfect so that, that is enough okay and let's consider you also have a fair bit of understanding of electron so like since most of us are from biomedical including me the core part of biomedical which i love is the uh, conjunction of having computer application where you have uh, you get to know about what is c what is object oriented programming c++ and also you get to learn a lot of electronics you have ecad you can you when you have subjects like ecad 1 you get subjects like ecad 2 you have <clears throat> even uh, microcontroller programming microprocessor programming and you also have other subjects which gets you about 
uh, electronic signal processing, right? So these are very, very, very core concepts which is covered in any biomedical course, right? So that is like a boon for most of us. Which so when when I actually meet many of uh, 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 like my colleagues or other people from other industries who have done say engineering from completely computer science background or completely from an electronics background, come and ask me like, how did you get in robotics? So I say this is what I had in my course. They're like, oh, this is wonderful. Like this is everything you want to learn for getting into robotics, like cross functional or a multifunctional field, which has every information on everything and you, which you have, which gets you to know the basics of everything, right? So that is why I, I, I mean, I love that I was in biomedical. Maybe if I would have been in computer science, uh, then I would have completely focused only on writing algorithms. Or maybe if I would have been, been in say electronics field, I would have completely focused on just making electronic circuits or concentrating on microcontrollers or processors and uh, developing those stuff. So, but by as being a biomedical engineer, I never wanted to stop any of uh, like exploring any of the other fields. So I wanted to have all of them in hand and robotics was the way which helped me out. So let's, by considering these two assumptions, say you have a very good knowledge of programming, a little bit at least, and a basic knowledge of electronics. That's it, man. That, that's it. What, that's what you want to start learning robotics. But again, again, the question remains the same. Okay, where do I start my learning? You were right that, okay, you can, you have some basic knowledge of this, but where do I start? Like, how do I start? That's the question which everyone has today, right? So a very easy and a very basic necessity for most of the robotics development today is what is called robot operating system. So what does it actually do? Right. What what is Ross? Like I've been many many people have actually heard like like Darshana has already started working on the bottom or Ross if I'm not wrong. So many people have already heard what is Ross. Many people know okay, this Ross has a very huge capability of doing something. But what does it exactly do? What how does it help me to learn robotics in the most easiest way? Right? That is a question. So let's see what, what exactly is Ross. Okay. So when you say what is Ross? And when you understand robot operating system, many of us think of it as an operating system, like any any operating system, like Windows or uh, Ubuntu or uh, Mac or any any such operating systems, which uh, like a Raspberry Pi, R Pi OS. So, is is it actually an operating system? No. When you say a robot operating system, it doesn't mean an operating system which actually runs on your uh, desktop. No, it is actually a uh, I mean, a middleware, you can call it as a middleware. What do you mean by that? So robot ROS is more of a middleware, something like a lower level framework, okay, which sits just in between your programming application, say a software which you made for your robot and your operating system, which is say Ubuntu. Okay, so yeah, and one more thing is that ROS is not available for uh, <clears throat> Windows, okay, or Mac for that matter of fact. The, both of them are actually under development right now. So they are making developments or uh, you can say a beta version of testing. You know, go, it's go, actually going on for Windows and Mac, but it is majorly uh, Ubuntu, right? So Ross started as a framework, which was uh, available only for Ubuntu, which is available only for Ubuntu right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have Ubuntu, like the operating system, which can access any hardware on your laptop, right? You can access your USB port. You can attach a camera and open your camera from the USB port. You can ha you have an Ethernet chip on your PC, right? You can access your TCP connections. You can access IP connections, whatever you want to do over networking layer. You have a desktop over your monitor. You have speakers. You have any hardware which is available on your laptop, right? Yeah. Did someone want to ask something? Okay, so yeah, so like I said, so ROS now sits just on top of your physical hardware or your operating system, which is Ubuntu, and it, it sits in between your programming application as well. So it is like a support system it, it or a, a basic lower level framework, which helps you to get started into robotics easily. So when Darshana said she was uh, designing inverse kinematics application, she really didn't know how to get that data 
from that neural kinematics code and make it work on the robot she was preparing or make it work on any simulation she has already made say so she did a simulation on some other stock software and she wrote the code in matlab and she doesn't know how do i link these two like she doesn't know like where do i start and where do i end i know this should work on this robot but how do i test this right that that's the biggest question everyone has so and most of us don't even have a robot so for any application which i want to build or any proof of concept which i have to show to someone i cannot start from scratch building the robot there are some robots which are which which from a mechanical point of view is very like a uh, easy one to achieve or a very uh, like a cliche i mean a design which can be easily achieved so you don't have to actually you know sit and design it and waste time but you know you have to prove the proof of concept like we use using just a simple device i can actually do this so your proof of concept is something else but you waste time designing your robot right that is the biggest problem which we have here so so robot operating system like i said which sits in the middle has two major things one is a core with some communication tools which you will get so these things just keep it in your mind okay just keep it in your mind hang on a bit i will the moment i'm completed with my theory i'm actually going to show you what exactly this is what did i mean by a core all i mean everything which i'm stating right now okay so a core something 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 like a core say something a block a block which just sits above your ubuntu system and below your software code just think of it as like that okay a, a block with some communication tools okay and the next thing is a set of plug and play libraries say tomorrow say tomorrow darshana wanted to make sure that the code which she developed for getting uh, xy coordinates uh, so for getting theta from giving an xy can be used for, for any robot she wants so if tomorrow it is not just being used for a single robotic arm she wants to use it for this so again there are many different robotic arms in the industry so uh, like a scara robot a six axis arm a four axis arm based on how many axes it has what is the application it is used for there are different robotic arms okay but say most of them have the same inverse kinematic code okay everyone everything has the same inverse kinematic code which has to be used so can darshana go ahead and make a library obviously she can she can actually make a library and say okay anyone who wants to develop a scala robot tomorrow use my library to calculate your uh, theta like calculate your theta using any x y you want use my library can you do that yes but how do you do that right you are developing say code in java and she is giving your code in c++ and she says come on integrate this and you're like how do i do that i cannot actually access your data type or your data variables into my code that doesn't happen right i cannot even in include like i cannot do a hash include c++ library in my javascript so there are obviously there are, there are certain ways you can do it you can actually have cross platform for python c++ but that's not feasible for a very large framework or a very large code base because any robot in a developing robot doesn't have to be like just two programs and you run it and it works no it doesn't happen that way there are like hundreds of programs and like thousands of lines of code which it is written and now integrating everything on a single package like a single package which is like an executable you just give it to someone and they run that executable and the robot works that that's how robot should work right now to do that these kind of problems like cross platform uh libraries which uh which you want to make which you don't have everything the solution for that is a robot operating system so two things like like i said a block which sits in between ubuntu and your software which does the communication work for you and also gives you a lot of core sets of libraries and plug and play uh, options apis for achieving anything which is relevant to the field of say robotics okay So yeah, uh, Ross was actually originally developed in 2017. Uh, sorry, 2007. If I'm not sorry, sorry for the mistake. Uh, from Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Now, now it is actually being run and owned by Open Source uh, Robotics. Open, okay. So, so Open Source Robotics Foundation is again uh, a company which uh, manages Ross, which keeps. Uh, so if you might have heard about Rosscon. or attended in ross seminars that is actually being hosted by open source robotics okay so these this company is one which takes care of the entire ross uh, 
application or the ROS architecture and everything. And also we have a very big community of ROS uh, developers who keep adding new features to different packages or different libraries which are available in ROS. And that's how anyone across anywhere in the world can access any particular library and just simply you know, make their application easy to develop. So your, your, your goal should be achieving your proof of concept. Your goal shouldn't be again researching on something which has already been researched or which has already been done in the most flawless way possible. You don't have to again keep reinventing it. You already know what your proof of concept is. So Ross said, OK, I'm the man. You come to me. You tell me what your proof of concept is. You keep doing whatever you want. I'll provide you whatever backup you want from me. So that is what Ross is. So the next question is why is Ross? So this is actually uh, the most common story okay and this is again a story which uh, i've seen myself in my life or many like uh, but i mean i've experienced it in my life so it happens that whenever i want to start say any any uh, robotic application okay say consider uh, any any student today who wants to develop a new cool robotics project say she or he you know starts planning and working on the project so the moment uh, they discover that the concepts or the theory of robotics is easy I understand it, but when it comes to simulation or when it comes to programming it, how do I do that? How like where, where do I start? How do I achieve it? This is a very co common problem. And yet what I do is I go ahead and I use different frameworks or different programming languages to achieve all these things. I actually use different programming languages. I do communication also in between all of these programming languages to share data somehow. I don't know how like a C++ program which is throwing some data, I have to capture it in a Java application which is running parallelly, right? So I have to do that because one application runs, say, controls one specific hardware of the robot and the other application controls another specific hardware. And the libraries or the APIs for these hardware, say, which is provided by the manufacturer. Okay, say if tomorrow I have a Logitech camera and the Logitech tells me that you want to do image processing, okay, you want to do image processing on your uh, Logitech camera, go ahead, I'll, I'm giving you the APIs. So that it makes a job easier for you. You capture the image, you do whatever you want with the image. I'll give you the APIs, like I'll give you the libraries. But Logitech says, sorry boss, I just have libraries in C, pure C. Okay, now you find a way to integrate it in your application. So what I do, I make a C program completely. Okay, and I write a code for C and I say, okay, blah, 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 this is done. Okay, I'm getting the images and I'm extracting, say, a particular point or a particular part of the image and I have the data for it. Now, I developed my web, web application or say another application which runs on a real-time basis in say Java or a Python. How do I get this data transferred to this application? Both, are, both of them are running separately, okay? And I have to achieve this somehow, okay? But I find a way, okay? I just imagine that I find a way to do this. Somehow, I find a way, somehow I implement a communication, okay? So the next thing is that, after doing a lot of research, after doing a lot of hard work on things which shouldn't have been my point of focus, okay, in robotics, my point of focus should have been proving my proof of concept for which I already had the code, but there were some middleways which I had to implement myself, and that is what took a lot of time for me. And in the end, I failed, say, in my work, okay? I couldn't actually show the proof of concept because I, I got too busy into developing things which were not necessary for me. As a beginner, I don't know all these things. I just know I want to achieve this. This is a very small part of the robotics application which I learned and I want to prove this. But to prove this, I had to do a lot of other things which I was not aware of or which I was not ready to code for, right? That is like one of the major things which we all have. So what happens is say tomorrow, I created this code and I just kept it as an archive. I just put it aside. I said, okay, if someone else might need it, they can use it. Say another person actually starts developing a similar kind of application and he tries to find what are the frameworks or what are the different codes which are already available. And he says, Abhinav, you already made something. Okay, just give me that. I'll, I'll try to find a way to use all your codes and build my proof of concept in a faster way. So he goes ahead and he takes all my code and somehow he makes an entire framework or an entire standalone framework to make sure that these libraries or these 
uh, APIs can be used flawlessly without a problem by anyone tomorrow. So he makes a framework, okay, from scratch. And that was how actually uh, ROS was actually founded that way. So there was one girl who was working on an entire robotic application. She developed everything she could for integrating her uh, application, but she failed at the end. And somehow she collaborated with someone else who made her life easier by developing a framework for making all these applications sit together and communicate. That's the main part, communicate with each other. And that's how actually ROS was found, founded. So like every person who wants to explore ROS or who wants to learn robotics as, as a beginner faces this problem of where to start, how to make things communicate with each other, how to have two different applications running differently, communicate with each other and how to learn the concepts of robotics. You are as a beginner for us, it is not about how do you code in C++ or how do you code in Python, right? That is something you can learn on the fly. You can keep, you know, writing codes on a daily basis again and again and again, you can learn. But what is important for, for us right now is to understand the concepts of robotics. Say, what is inverse kinematics? What is forward kinematics? What does the algorithm do? Say, what 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 is uh, uh, the algorithm to find the fastest or the shortest path, okay, from point A to point B? What is the method of uh, simultaneously mapping points in an area, and what what does it actually do? What 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 slam actually means? Understand what is that? So, for understanding these things, you guys already need an environment which has all the all of these libraries and all of these APIs ready. And it tells you just make a simple framework. You are a code. You just integrate all these libraries and you start learning. The moment you are good with your concepts, you can actually start coding by yourself on a very larger scale, right? You can coding is not an issue for anyone. Coding is something anyone can learn anyhow. Okay. If they want to learn, they'll learn somehow. But the point is about learning the concepts. So to, to understand the theories which are already there in robotics into a practical scenario. Right, that is where ROS comes into picture. That is what ROS actually does for you. So now, let's say so. So from all these points which I just mentioned, what is the main goal? The main goal is that I do not want to keep reinventing the wheel, or I don't want to keep reinventing something which has already been done. Say a slam algorithm is being developed by a company or by a group of developers to the best possible way. Now, should I use that or as a beginner, should I keep doing it again? Should I start writing what is slam? What is the, uh, what, what, what kind of programming language should I use for slam again, developing an entire algorithm that, that, that doesn't make sense for you as a beginner. Your important goal is to understand slam and implement it on any robot, which you're making. Say it can be a simple uh, two wheeled robot, a very small robot. You just know you, you're attaching two motors to it, two motor drivers to it and a basic Arduino controller and you're saying, you're developing a code in your laptop and saying, come on, just you know, go around this entire room and try to find the end, uh, a map of this and try to go autonomously. You just want to do that. So what is more important to you? Understanding what SLAM does, that is more important to you or writing the code? No, right? Writing the code is not a possible solution for you. So avoid the inventing. That is the first main goal. So uh, again, one more thing is that uh, a standard. So Everyone can provide you uh, libraries for SLAM or any other uh, pro, I mean, uh, uh, robotic application, say in this kinematics, forward kinematics, uh, uh, there, there's something called as torque control, velocity control of motors and a lot of other things. Okay. So image processing for the matter of fact, natural language processing. Okay. So all these applications uh, can be developed by many people in a very, you know, better way, but can that library be used by everyone? So that, that's the biggest question. So is there a standard which is being developed by people so to make it easier for someone to use it? No. So that is where ROS comes into picture again. ROS says, if you're developing something, develop it in my standard. I'll give you some guidelines to develop a library, okay? Which can be easily just copy and paste it into some other workspace and you know build, you can easily build it and you can integrate it. That's how easy it should be. So ROS gives you some guidelines for that. So you as a developer, say you want to do a, a, a revolution in the robotic community and you say there's one problem which I know how to code. Nobody has actually coded it before. So I'll give you a library for that and you use ROS 
as a medium to create that library or to code that library and then you put it in the ROS community. And ROS is perfect. This is very good. So I can actually put it in my server in ROS server and make it available for everyone in, in the world. They can actually install that package whenever they want. Import that package into say C++ code or Python code, whichever like programming language that ROS supports. OK, and then you start coding. That's it. That's how easy it can be, right? So yeah, so if you want to program a mobile robot, a robotic arm, a drone, a vending machine, anything, anything you want to make, you can use a robot operating system. That's how easy it is. OK. Yeah, so. Going ahead, so uh, I mean, I don't want to bore you more about the concept, so let's show. Let me show you like the different robots around the world which are being or which had been developed using ROS as the main framework. OK. So there's a link to it. OK, you can, if you want to see what are the robots which are currently available, which has a raw support. So basically by meaning raw support, what I mean is that you don't actually have to have the robot physically present with you. OK, there is a simulation environment for the entire robot put in ROS. You just go to ROS, you install ROS in your uh, laptop, you install the specific package for that robot. And then you can actually see it in a 3D view and you can actually play with it. You can code to make something. Say you want to make the robot dance or you want to make the robot move from point A to point B. Your application, your proof of concept is learning. OK, your, your end goal is learning something. So you take any robot you want and you can actually learn. OK, so that's how easy robot is. So so we are you can see around like 15 robots, but actually the number of robots which have been developed using ROS is around more than 150 or 200 and that's which which is which is actually registered with ROS and apart from that um, like billions of millions of people who are actually using ROS to develop their robots in their organization again might contribute to ROS and they will show that that those robots again will might might be put into ROS as well so there are like many 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 robots which are being developed around the world okay so <clears throat> uh, yeah so when i say ROS like I said, it is not an operating system. OK, it's not Ubuntu or Windows. It is something which sits in your Ubuntu or Windows, right? It, it's, it's middleware. So these are the current distributions which we have. OK, so ROS Noetic is the latest one which we have. And for ev every since uh, since ROS is only available for Ubuntu right now. OK, so for every Ubuntu distribution we have, we have a specific ROS distribution. So basically, say if you are using Ubuntu 20, which is the latest 20.4 say which is the latest uh, okay uh, long term supported uh, ubuntu distribution then for that you have to install ros no 8 the first one which you can see and if you're using ubuntu 18 okay then you have to use ros melodic you have to install ros melodic in your system so it doesn't happen that you can actually install ros no in a ubuntu 18 system or ros melodic in a ubuntu 20 system so every ros distribution is specific for a ubuntu distribution so it goes hand in hand and if you try to install uh, any other ros distribution say in uh, ubuntu 20.4 apart from noetic then you actually get installation errors okay it doesn't happen so uh, yeah so again ros can kinetic so the most widely used okay till now has been uh, melodic and kinetic and Noetic is the newest one, which has a, a lot of improvements and it's the most recommended one because every error or every bug in every single package has been solved, right? On, on, a, on a regular basis, they keep uh, solving the bug. So this is the one uh, ROS as a community is uh, working on right now. They have stopped working on uh, Melodic and Kinetic. So if you have newer bugs in your Kinetic or Melodic, uh, uh, this thing, ROS distribution, then I don't think they'll help you out much. So if you're using ROS Noetic, then that's easy. So ROS Noetic is available for Ubuntu 20.4. So yes, and the installation. So installation is actually uh, the most simplest thing. So ROS has actually uh, showed everything it, uh, you need to install your ROS uh, distribution on your Ubuntu specific distribution, right? So you just have to do is you just have to go to installation. OK. And you can actually see, uh, so so you, are, you have to choose, say if I'm choosing Noetic or Melodic, say if I'm choosing Noetic for installation, and I choose my specific uh, 
uh, like operating system so right now uh, for uh, most of the linux kernel ubuntu is the most supported linux kernel right now uh, by raw uh, they have also developed certain uh, packages for some other distributions as well uh, other linux distributions as well uh, okay and say so if uh, it can be an arm arm based uh, linux distribution okay it doesn't have to be a 64 bit distribution okay so ubuntu is the most widely one and if you see there's also something called as source installation source installation is basically for someone who has a different operating system okay or a different kernel and you have you don't have a specific uh, say executable file which installs everything properly so what you have to do is you have to go to the source like you have to go to the actual source code of uh, ros and you have to keep installing you have to building you have to keep build uh, you have to build the uh, code based on your operating system based on your kernel uh, problems and everything and then you have to install it so that is what is source installation and as you can see windows is actually an experimental one which they are doing it right now i think most probably like in a year or so they might release one of the uh, like working uh, i mean patch of ROS for Windows. I think that that will happen in a year or so. So if I if I click on Ubuntu right now, I can show you guys. If I see in Ubuntu, there is a list of commands which you have to paste in a terminal. You say you just go ahead and start a terminal, okay? And in the terminal, you just keep pasting all these commands like one by one. See some of them, some of you who are new to Ubuntu might not understand these commands, but the moment you start using Ubuntu kernel or say any Linux distribution, it's, 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 it will become very easy for you. So don't worry about what are the commands right now. So just focus on what you have to do. So everything is put up here. Just keep copy pasting it one by one. Say, and okay, so you can go ahead and copy paste every single command and you can actually install your ROS, it's as simple as that. This page has everything which is needed for your installation. You don't have to go anywhere else and then start looking for how do I install. No, you don't have to. You have an Ubuntu 18 or Ubuntu 20 or an Ubuntu 16. Go ahead, find the right, right ROS distribution for it. Just click on the installation process. They'll show you what you have to do. It's as simple as it can get. Also, there's another tutorial. So every ROS tutorial or everything which ROS uh, have provided in their website, it has a video tutorial as well. Because that is how that is that is like that is a contribution of everyone around the world towards ROS. Right? That that's that's how they actually make it easier for everyone. So yes, uh, I mean I cannot show you the entire installation right now. I already have installed ROS in my system. Uh, showing an entire installation right now would be a very tedious task. Okay, it will take a lot of time. Uh, but there's one thing which I wanted to know, let you guys know. Is that say if you want to install an entire uh, GUI or graphical user interface as well version of ROS where you have simulation where you have uh, uh, like modeling and everything, then ROS, uh, the desktop full version is the one which you guys should go ahead with. Okay. Uh, again, so every every ROS like I said has a different distribution like Noetic, Kinetic, Melodic. You have to specify the distribution before any installation. Like if you want to install any particular uh ROS version or any ROS particular package you have to specify the distribution you are installing it okay so that is where you go ahead with desktop full a say if you don't want to have a lot of tools you just go ahead with the base version ROS desktop or or this one more thing so many people so when you say a robot it's a moving robot okay you don't actually use an entire uh, pc to control it from a station right so the robot itself can have brain a small brain so there are many and many linux distribution based uh, you can say a computing system very small computing system like raspberry pi or uh, asus tinkerboards or uh, like uh, even there are the many there are many other uh, operating system boards which are available in the market okay very small ones which can be placed directly on the robot and which has enough computing power that you can do image processing. You can do, uh, okay, so one of the most widely used one is uh, NVIDIA Jetson boards. If, if as anyone heard about NVIDIA Jetson before or have used NVIDIA Jetson anytime before. So I think Jetson boards are the one which are most widely used, okay? So by meaning NVIDIA Jetson, since it is developed by NVIDIA, they give you a graphic uh, processing unit as well, GPU as well in the board. So it makes anyone 
who wants to learn robotics or any kind of image processing application much easier. OK, so yeah. So if you want to install DOS in those kind of uh, uh, systems where you're not going to attach any desktop, right? You're not going to visually see anything because you know you've already deployed the code. You know this is the particular code which has to run on the robot. So what you do is you install bare, OK, the base or the bare bones package of DOS, which doesn't have uh, GUI tools or desktop or anything, OK? You just directly, whatever you want to do, you do it on the terminal, OK? That is enough for you, right? You just uh, do an SSH, like a secure shell connection to your robot, and you start typing in the terminal whatever you want, launching a particular program, running a particular uh, algorithm or anything. You don't have to actually have a desktop. So this is where this reduces the amount of packages being installed and the clusters, right? So bare bones is the one for those kind of applications. After installing the application, OK, after installing ROS, say you want to install a particular library which is provided in ROS, but which doesn't actually get installed with the main installation process, OK? Because they don't want to like put a lot of junk in your laptops or, or your desktop. So they provide different packages separately. So all I have to do is again, install app install that particular distribution that particular package name you want to install so one such as application you can see is a ROS noetic slam g mapping you want to just install slam g mapping go ahead type ROS hyphen your distribution kinetic noetic melodic hyphen the package name so that's how you can actually install different packages okay so those who want to actually today if you want to you have a Ubuntu system with you and you want to start installation go ahead to this website, OK, installation and find your particular distribution. OK, ROS, Noetic or Melodic or whichever distribution you want to install. And you also have a video video tutorial here. OK, so I'll be skipping this part because it's a very long process of installation, but it's a very easy one. You just have to copy paste the commands. OK, so going ahead. Uh, OK. So. Yes, I do have a certain uh, amount of robots. Robot. Which... I'm sorry for that. So I can, as you can see, uh, there are a lot of simulation environments as well, which, which let you actually start you know, simulating a robot before you actually make the robot physically. So this is what an AGV is. You can see that. So these are some surveillance robots you can see.
So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think someone has turned your mic on. <laughs> Okay. okay, I'll go ahead. Okay, so like like you saw, I mean, these are different kinds of robots which are developed by uh, many industries and uh, many companies all over the world, many institutions which are famous for robotics courses and, uh, uh, you know, uh, application systems or do they have laboratories around the world? They actually use ROS. Okay, so what are the core components of ROS? So like like I explained so many things about ROS right now, what what actually builds ROS? What are, what are the core components of ROS? What do you have there? Okay. So the first thing which we have is called a ROS, ROS core or a ROS master. Okay. So what do you mean by ROS master? Just think of it. Okay. Just think of it as someone uh, who has opened, uh, say, like he's, he's one, he's like, a, like a, he's a middle guy. Okay. And he gives a variety of options for anyone uh, who wants to communicate. Okay. Who wants to send data between two, like, say, from one person to another. He's the one you have to approach. Okay, so this guy is uh, running on your system 24/7, and he's waiting for new people to register. Okay, register themselves to him. Say saying that okay, my name is Abhinav. Okay, I want to register myself to you, and I'll be doing a particular process, and I'll be sending out this data, or I'll be giving this data, which you can share with anyone you want. So this middle guy is ready, and he says okay. Your name is Abhinav and you're doing something over here for me and I will share your data to whomever asks me for. So this thing, this thing is done by ROS master or the ROS code. This is like the major or the, the, the main component of ROS. OK, and I'll surely show you what ROS score is and how does it work uh, in, in the practical session. OK, just just hang on there. The next thing which we have is the nodes and the packages. So like I said, OK, every library or everything which someone develops. Ross says you develop it in a way that I tell you to. OK, so that anyone around the world can actually use that without without a problem. So how do you do that? So the first thing we should do is something called as packages. OK, Ross has a particular way of managing of managing codes, OK, large and large uh, files of codes in a way that everyone can access or everyone can install in, in, in just a matter of time. OK, so packages are the way uh, which is suggested by ROS to bundle to bundle a lot of programs. OK, let it be a C++ program, let it be a Python script, let it be a JavaScript. You bundle your programs in something called as package and you just give me that bundled package. You just give a name to that package and you just share it with me. OK, ROS tells you that. And the moment you share it with me, I can share it with whomever you want. Or you don't have to actually share it with me. You just directly share it with whomever you want to. If they have ROS, if you have ROS, you have created a package which has a lot of programming uh, codes, okay, uh, different programs. Just share that package, copy paste it into someone else's workspace, and they can actually use that package. That's where ROS gives you the platform, okay? That is what the platform is, the lower level platform where people don't have to reinvent or don't have to think about how do I implement or how do I import a particular code or a particular package which has already been created in the best way it can be and just import it into my code and just you know solve my purpose. So that is where ROS gives you something called as package. OK, and the next thing which we have is the node. A node is nothing but a program. OK. So Ross says you can actually write a program. You can write any program you want. You uh, say you write uh, add to integers dot py. You make a program which has a function in Python which just adds to integers, and then you give it a node. That that is what is called a node. That that program is called a node. Add to integers dot py. The Python file is a node. Okay, for Ross. And there's another script called subtract to integers dot cpp. Okay, that's a C plus plus file again, and that again will have a particular function which does the subtraction work for you. So you give again that subtraction code or that file CPP file a node name. OK, a different node name. That's it. So that are that, those are actually nodes 
and these nodes these nodes actually sit inside the package it's, it's a bundle like like i said it's the bundle of programs or it's the bundle of nodes which are being uh, stacked okay the next thing which we have is the messages and topics okay and services for that matter of fact messages are the way you communicate you say Abhinav has sent me a code. Ross Master keep track, keeps a track of all these things. Okay, it, it is like a middle guy. Okay, there's one node or a one program which is saying that I'm sending you the data of adding two integers. Say you're, you're passing me five and two. I'm saying seven is the answer. This is the message. The middleman actually takes this message from person A and shares it with person whomever want that answer, right? Whomever want that answer of addition of five plus two. Whoever wants that uh, output, you can actually take it from me, from the ROS core or the ROS master. So messages and topics are the way which you communicate in ROS. Message is the data which you want to share. Topic is a name or you can say a telephone line, okay, which is open, like which is open. Anyone or like a, you can consider it as a WhatsApp call, okay, which is open for whomever who wants to listen to that particular topic or that particular data which is being shared in that topic. So it can be a topic called adding two integers. OK, the topic is adding two integers. Whoever wants to see the output of any two integers being added, come here. I'll say I'll I'll share that answer to you. That is what topic is. And the message is an integer. OK, the message is the integer, which is the addition of two. Numbers as simple as that. So if tomorrow you're building a, a image processing application, OK, and uh, you have completed the image processing application and at the end of the code, your output, your output is you give me an image as an input. My output is finding a circle in that image, finding any object which is circle in that image and sharing the data of that object. OK, so what I do is say uh, someone here in this uh, seminar, like say. Uh, uh, like Darshana for that example has created a package for uh, like uh, getting getting an image as an input. OK, taking an image as an input and sharing a circular uh, object uh, like uh, an output which is a circular object of uh, from that image the data of a circular object from that image like what is what is the radius of that object what is the diameter or say what is the centroid or what is the center of that circle whatever okay x y position or some coordinates from that image i just take that package from darshana and i just paste it in my ross workspace or my current workspace which i'm working in and i build it and i just say darshana has given me two topics one topic is called the image input where I share the image input to her from my video camera. So her package doesn't have to do anything with the camera configuration or what is the camera being used or how is it used. She has created in a very simple way that you just give me image data. Let it be a JPEG file or a, a bitmap file. Just give me that image. OK, I take that image. I decode it. I find the circular object in that and I share that data in another topic, say output. Topic name can be output, just output. I share that data. So what I'll do is in my program, I'll basically say publish to image input topic, receive or subscribe from image output topic. Simple. So I'm passing something to that package. I'm getting an answer from that package. And that's how ROS makes it easier for anyone to know integrate any particular package or library in their code. And messages also have a way of data. So like basically, basically it means that you have particular data structures which are mentioned by ROS. Again, that is where ROS keeps a standard. You cannot actually go ahead and pass anything as a message. You cannot actually go ahead and type a JSON data which is which you say it's just a message. Just take it or you can say like any any random uh, file as a input to any topic. You cannot do that. There's a standard. If this particular topic only takes input in a particular data type, that is the data type you have to provide. And that data type should be known by the ROS environment. OK, so that is where the standardization actually comes into picture. So ROS doesn't allow anyone to just randomly put anything as a message in the uh, ROS environment. So the data structures are fixed. You can create a, your own data structures from the base data types like integer float so you uh, does anyone know what a data structure is can you even tell me what a data structure is in c or c plus plus or in any python you can type it on the chat if you want 
So does anyone know a data structure? Anyone who is familiar with programming C or C++? I can, I can I'll give you a minute. You can go ahead and type a data structure that I actually can explain that as a example. Anyone? Okay, no problem. So, okay, I'll show you what the data structure is uh, in, 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 the, in the coming parts. So, yeah, so a structure can be uh, a cluster of basic, exactly. So, a data organized in a language. Someone said it. So, Samruti. So, thank, thank you so much. So, basically, you say in C, I know what is an integer, I know what is a float, I know what is a string. But my message, say my message, is about a person. It's like like an identification of a person which has a name, which can be string, which has a field called age, which is an integer, which has a field of say something else, like a, a height of the person which I can mention in float. Okay, something point something inches. Okay, so. Yes, okay, yeah, so thank you Vishal as well. So for that, so yes, so what, what it does is actually I can cluster integer, I can add float, I can add string as well in a particular bundle called a structure okay that is what a data structure is so what ross tells is you have basic data types integer float uh, uh string and all of the data types which are available in c c plus plus and python use those data types okay arrays if you want to define array do it go ahead do it and you bundle it in a structure and you create your own message type okay which falls under these basic data types and then you can Use it. You can use it in a ROS application. Just mention, uh, yes. So in Python, uh, as Gaurav has mentioned, list, dictionary, tuple, and set are the basic data types. Okay, there are some other data types as well. Those are basic data types in Python. So what I can do is I can actually have a, a list and a dictionary. Okay, co combined together as a message. Say in list, I'll be sending some, uh, say, uh, uh, like. Of some values of the temperature sensor. Okay, in a dictionary, I'll be actually having a key value pair of what has what value. Okay, something like that. Okay, and that I'll bundle it together as a message structure, and I will tell Ross, say this is a custom message structure which I have made for my application. Okay, and I'm giving you this information. So Ross says, okay, fine. So you are actually working on a temperature sensor. Or, or say you're working on a data of someone, like getting data from an image of someone. Okay, you you get an image, you uh, recognize that person in that image, and you say your data structure has a string called name, has an integer called age, has a float value called height, and you're passing these three values as a complete structure or complete data to me. Process is perfect. I understand your language. Good. So anyone who wants to just use this package, can just try to find out what is the message structure they are publishing and create a code where you just listen to that topic, listen to that particular topic and extract that message type or that data type, that data structure. Okay. Uh, I'm really sorry, guys. Just a second. I'll be uh, back in a second. Okay. Really sorry for that. Uh, yes, sorry for that interruption. Uh, yeah, so continue. So messages and topics are that. Okay, and there's the more things to it. Okay, which we won't be able to cover right now or cover today. So we have something called as services. We also have something called as actions and parameters. So services, actions and parameters are not just message topics, right? So Ross says you don't have to only keep sending and receiving data okay you can also do something you can actually call a service you can actually call an action where basically you say if i get a particular data i call another action server which doesn't sit on my program but which sits on the pc 
which is managed by ROS master and actually call the function. That function will actually do the entire processing at that particular point of time and give me an output. OK, not like another program, which is just completely, you know, constantly being constantly publishing some data. I actually don't want that kind of a thing. I actually want a service or an action where I give the data and I say perform this function and then give me an output. So that is where services, actions and parameters come into picture. OK. So these are core components of ROS and as you can see like this, this is a ROS where you have a master, where you have messages, you have topics, you have packages, you have nodes and you have services and action libraries. And that is what makes up ROS as a core component or a core. OK. So like I said, uh, the most important part of ROS is the communication, the communication tool which enables two different programs to share data in a very standardized manner, which both of the programs can understand. OK, this is the data type. I can understand this data type. If I get a message of this data type, I know Okay, this is the data. So a standard way of communicating. How do you communicate? That is that is with ROS. Like a beginner, as a beginner, you don't have to worry about how two programs are going to communicate. How are they sharing the data? You just have to concentrate about what data should be shared and what program you have to write to make a robot. That's it. That is your problem. Everything else is being managed and taken care of by ROS. OK, by ROS and the ROSCO. So the three main communication tools, like I mentioned, first thing is a topic. A topic is anything like a, a, a WhatsApp call, you can say, which you give it a name or, or a telephone line, which is open to many people where you give a name or a topic saying, Input input like uh, image input or image output. The moment you have uh, any data, you you keep your ears. The moment you keep your ears to that particular topic, you can keep listening to that particular data type or that particular message. OK, and the moment you want to take out your ear from that, you can do that. You can actually stop listening and you can start listening to some other topic. So topics are basically you can say uh, like uh, communication lines being managed by Ross master at the base level, which is being initialized or initialized by the different nodes. A node initializes a topic, registers that topic to ROS master. ROS master says, OK, this is a ROS topic which you have. OK, any other program or any other node which comes and tells me I want data from this particular topic. OK, go ahead. I'll give you the data. It's as simple as that. OK, services, like I said, is a specific set of function which you just want to call at a particular time, like say add to integers is a service. OK. The moment I call add two integers, I pass two integers. It will do the addition for me. It will send me back the data. So over here, I'm not doing anything over topics. Um, over here, I'm directly calling a function. I'm actually calling a function whenever I want to. OK. Last thing, our action. So these are basically services, but in a more complex way, you can think of it like that. So services and action are not something I'll be able to you know, cover today because it will take a lot of time. But today I'm going to give you a basic idea or basic practical knowledge of ROS. OK. So yes, this is uh, on a nutshell. In a, in a nutshell, if I try to explain ROS communication tools and ROS core sits at the bottom level. On top of which you have different nodes or different programs, program A or node A, program B or node B, which can be written in C++, which can be written in Python or which can be written in Java. So these three languages are supported by ROS right now. OK, it can be written in any of these three languages. And Ross says, go ahead, boss, you do whatever you want. You pass that data to me. I'll pass that data to whomever wants it. OK, and if program B wants it, I'll share it with him. If program C wants it, I'll share it with them. Simple as that. It's easy for you to communicate. Also, apart from that, there are different motion planning libraries. There are different camera based applications. There are different drivers for different hardware. Say if you want to use a joystick. So I think many of us, OK, for me, for me, when we were actually uh, working on uh, uh, some robotic uh, projects or you can say competitions, we uh, in Vidya Lanka, we actually had a team called uh, Robocon. OK, so we when we were trying to participate in Robocon, the most important thing or uh, for Rob or Robocon is that you add a joystick to it. OK, joystick to your robot, which you're developing. Now, if I wanted, uh, if in, back in that day, I really remember when we had to actually hack the entire joystick we had to hack uh, the entire firmware of the joystick. Make sure that I write a code 
which specifically gets the specific data or the data type of that joystick and then convert it into the data type which I want. OK, and that way you listen to also you also have to make events or listener callbacks for that joystick. So say if someone has pressed the left key, then immediately I have to have a listener function which jumps to that uh, left key a listener callback immediately because that's how important the real time application is, right? If I'm, if I'm, using, if I'm in a competition, I'm actually uh, like, you know, moving my robot everywhere, then the joystick is the most important thing. It can be a wireless joystick. It can be a wired joystick. Now, if if we had the access of ROS or if we had a knowledge about ROS back in that day, integrating a joystick is exactly a two minute job or a five minute job. It's that easy. OK, you don't have to learn what joystick is. OK, you don't have to actually sit and learn what is a firmware which is written by logistic uh, logitech, sorry, or any other uh, company which actually manufactures joystick. You don't have to do that. ROS says we have an entire package which covers every joystick, OK, which covers every joystick which is available. OK, all you have to do is install the joystick package in your ROS environment. OK, and I'll give you a message topic. I'll give you a message topic saying joystick output or any any topic say joy. OK, that topic will publish a specific set of data types or data structure which gives you the uh, value of every button on the joystick. And that is what I want. And that is as simple as it can be, right? If if everyone is trying to understand you, I want to integrate a joystick so that I can do simple motions like go forward, go back, go right, go left, turn around, whatever I want to do, shoot something. Say in, in case of Robocon, that that is like most of the theme, like we have to shoot something or we have to pick up something. That is how we you know, have to develop the robot, right? For so for this, every every button I can assign us a, a specific task, but to assign to to access the event of a button press it is very difficult. OK, so Ross does that for me. It takes that package. It says, boss, I have the package for you. You just listen to this particular topic, say joy or joystick in your program. You don't have to write an entire application of how to control or how to take data from joystick. You already have the data. Just listen to a particular topic and do whatever you want to do with that data. Say button press A means do this button press B means do this simple as simple as that. So that's how easy ROS is. You have hundreds and hundreds of libraries for motion planning, for image processing, for national lang natural language processing, or for any uh, CUDA enabled or any graphics processor enabled uh, image processing. Anything you want, anything you want. It's already been written by people and it's also being supported on a daily basis by those people who maintain those libraries or those repositories. You just install it in your system, OK, as a beginner. Just go ahead, try to find a readme file or a simple document which says how to you know, use that package and how to use the data which is being provided by that package and you use it in your application, simple. So your core, uh, I mean, uh, problem which was about learning robotics is easy, easily solved because you don't have to go ahead and actually break your head to find what are the different ways to integrate a particular hardware which is widely available or widely used in robotics or widely used by many robots. And how do I integrate it? No, you don't have to worry about. You already have a package for every such hardware. OK, so that's how easy ROS is. So this is like in, in a nutshell, this is what ROS does for you. So like I said, so there's a lot of theory which have already put in your heads and I think you might have you know uh, got a little dizzy right now, like a, a little bored. So the theory part is done. OK, so I will show you a little bit of. Practical OK, practical knowledge and what actually ROS is and what do I mean by these messages? What do I mean by different programs being integrated in one particular package and you no know, run it easily that that I'll show you now. OK, so. So when I go here. OK, say. Say today I have an Ubuntu system. OK, I have a ROS installed with me. OK, let's start with this. OK, so I have ROS installed with me. I have an Ubuntu system. I just go to any random folder in my PC. OK, and I say let's make a folder called workspace. For a new robot. Simple. OK, I just make a workspace. OK, now what ROS tells you is. 
the moment you make a workspace okay just make a new folder which says src or source which means source inside which you're going to place all your programs all your packages everything you want to place you place it inside src you don't let any of your folder or any of your programs come out of src it's as simple as that just make a folder called src place it okay now open a terminal we hope open a terminal in your workspace inside your workspace okay just run a command called as cat can make what ross will do for you is the moment you type a command called cat can make and the moment it identifies that that there is this folder called src in, inside this folder or the workspace it will immediately start building an entire ross workspace for you that's it that's easy it is like you don't have to actually go and say we have to copy this uh, file from here to here you have to actually uh, like you know go ahead and inside and then try to manage some other things you have to uh, manage some parameters nothing you just have to make a folder inside workspace folder inside which you make a source folder src just run catkin make and now you can see that instead of src there are two more folders i can show you here the two more folders called development and build which is being generated by ross which basically means that this entire folder this entire workspace is being taken care of by ross okay ross knows that there's a workspace called workspace new robot inside which there's a source folder there's a build folder and there's a development folder so you don't have to actually sit and think of how does ross come to know about this ross knows how, how to take care of this entire workspace okay so in a nutshell development is basically anything the any any changes you make inside this src any program which you add inside this src is taken care of by ross and the and like a, it's like an image okay it's like an image or it's like a map which is being developed by ross and stored inside the development folder so the map to your workspace is inside development and any binary any binary file which the computer understands like everything runs in binary in a computer any of the nutshell of all your programs and everything is kept inside binaries okay so build takes care of all those things okay so now what is the next step you you created a ross workspace environment and now you have to start writing codes so the first thing which i mentioned was packages right the first thing which i mentioned was ross packages so where do i create my ross package so again i go here okay this is my workspace i change my directory cd cd in ubuntu basically means change my directory to src go inside src over here what i do is that if i want to create a new package which by meaning of package there's a way okay there's like a way where it's like a map okay a map uh, a way or a map by which ross understands what are the programs kept in your package so what you do is there's a there's an inbuilt function called as catkin underscore create create package which is like a command which is given by ross you type catkin create package you give name to your package i give say pub sub tutorials that is what is going to be the package name and i say this package or this package will have programs which have programs written in ross python ross c++ as well and it also needs the standard messages which are already available in ross so i want all these dependencies these are basically again packages these are also packages which are installed in your laptop or in your uh, desktop when you install ross and ross knows where these are where these binaries are ross python ross c++ and standard messages and my my pack pop sub tutorial package is going to be dependent or needs these three packages to be available in my laptop okay or in my this thing so i create this with all these dependencies and ross does a job it says your package is created boss now you can go ahead and do anything which you want inside that package so by meaning of package what exactly happens if you go here if you check your source you have something called as pub sub tutorials being developed here and inside pub sub tutorial again okay there'll be again there'll be a source folder where you place all your programs so this is the package pub sub tutorials you can have multiple packages like this i can have another package say pub sub tutorials underscore 
okay and it'll create that for me again like like you can see i have mentioned pop sub tutorials 2 and it has created that package and that package will be placed alongside pop sub tutorials over here and inside pop sub tutorials inside that package i can have whatever programs i want so by meaning of package what i mean is that like like i said when i was developing joystick okay this can be a joystick package this can be a motion package where i just control the motors of the robot there can be another package called as camera package which will take care of only the camera processing image processing okay and inside all these packages i can have my code files as simple as that okay i can have whatever code file i want i can have a python file i can have a javascript file i can have a c++ file which does a job for me which, which i have written by myself and there can be some packages which have installed say a joystick package which i have actually borrowed from ross's you know inbuilt libraries or packages which have already been developed by some other people so i can just install those packages here and i can actually use it inside this package okay so let's go ahead inside my source let's let's do something okay let's let's make a new what do you say a code okay so what i do is i open my code studio so one of the best okay one of the best uh, coding platforms which you can use is is a uh, visual studio code okay uh, that is um, the most uh, widely used uh, coding uh, id or environment writer which which has support for every single programming language which you want to work with it has different extensions if you want to so different extensions for different kind of programming languages so it makes your life easier to code okay so let's get started in src i have pop sub tutorials inside which i have my src and what i do is i create a new file over here okay a new file which says publisher what is it going to publish i don't know just a script which has the name publisher okay publisher script and that script is going to be a python file let's say it's going to be a python file okay i make that now what is the first thing which i do okay since it's a python file i'm going to have some basic shebang commands of you which you don't have to worry about right now because this is not something which you might use on a regular basis so so i define a python file or a shebang command so the first thing what i do is i import what do i import i import ros python which is a package for developing any python code in ros okay which again sets your standard it gives you a standard the moment you do ros py ross knows okay this is this python file is being developed under my standard under my python file standard okay i do ross py then i import whatever package i want which already python has i don't have to worry about what kind of packages will be allowed by ross no ross has got nothing to do with the binaries which are already there in your ubuntu system like i said it sits in the middle right so when you're installing ubuntu okay ubuntu as a operating system in your laptop or in your desktop you already have most of the python uh, libraries like like time library or import say math library this is already there you don't have to worry that ross is going to allow this or not same way like i said ross doesn't interfere in your libraries or in your custom uh, things which you are developing ross just helps you out in a way that these packages can also be used packages developed in ross environments can also be used anything can be used in whatever way you want i will take care of the entire map or i'll take care of the entire scenario for you okay you just do your development work you don't worry about what has to be imported what cannot be imported no everything can be imported so i import time i import math okay now now since this is a publisher script okay like i said uh, the main motto of ross is you different you develop different program a python script or c++ file whatever you want and you share the data okay so let's do something over here i have a publisher script over here okay which is going to publish some data what is the type of the data it is going to be publishing say i am going to publish string a string which says hello just hello that's it that is what it going it is it is going to publish okay so what i do i import from standard underscore messages dot message okay i import string okay this is a standard data type which is called string which is provided by ross which is obviously provided by every programming language and it is stored in a package called standard messages okay 
ROS has a package called silent messages inside which it takes care of a data type called string. So if you want to pass string from one program to another program, you ask ROS that give me your standard string package and I'll use that to share a string. OK, it's as simple as that. I go ahead, I define a function, say define Taco. OK, the first thing which I do in Taco, like I said, every program, OK, every program you develop in ROS is called a node. OK, so this program to make this program, this bare Python program, a ROS node, what I do is that I use ROS's inbuilt node function. OK, in it, underscore node. OK, basically what I mean is that this is going to be my node. OK, this this program, this entire program is going to be one node. So that node function takes three inputs for or two inputs, depending on how much you want to actually provide. So the first input is obviously the name of the node. So I give the name the publisher. Node, so what do I mean by this? Like I said, the Ross master say is like a courier service guy who tells like what do you want to courier? OK, so if you want to courier something, you give me your name and your address first so that I actually know from whom or from which program it is being generated, right? So I give the name to this program as the publisher node. So the moment this program starts running, the ROS master, OK, let's go back to the slide once. The ROS master, OK, or the communication tool is going to take care of that program and it identifies that program in the entire ROS environment. It says, OK, there is a program called or the node called as the publisher node, which is high, which has started and I have to keep a track of this, OK? So what it does, so the next thing we'll do is the publisher node and there's something called as anonymous. Quiz false. This basically is to mention that if there are two different nodes called and our the publisher node which are being run, OK, to say I can run the same script two times. Python 3 publisher script, Python 3 publisher script two times, OK, in two different uh, terminals. So when I do that, the same publisher node is going to be, it's going to come up two times. So when I set anonymous as false, I basically tell Ross master that if something like that happens, same node, same uh, node being uh, like run twice, you just you know stop the previous node, which was uh, like which is being running. So you just stop the previous node, you start the new node again. Okay, you don't actually let two nodes with the same name run together. This is going to cause a problem. So don't let 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 anyone do that. Okay. And after that, what I do is my node is ready. Ross master knows that uh, a name a person called Labinov uh, is wants to courier something. So how, what is the channel? What is the channel he wants to use to courier that? OK, that is what is my publisher. OK, my publisher. Is basically say anything which. Publisher, OK, I define what the publisher is. Say I say the name of the to uh, topic where I'm going to publish. Is called as chatter. So chatter is a topic where I'm going to publish the message OK from this node OK chatter. What is the data type? Data type which we imported, which is nothing but string. OK, so that Ross master knows the moment this topic shows up, Ross master knows that this topic has a message type of string. So whoever wants to get data from this topic has to have string as their data type in the callback. OK, it's as simple as that and Q size which is basically how much data you want to store in a queue in case of data loss. OK. Now I've defined my function. OK. What I do is I set up a variable called as a rate, which basically tells me that if you want to. Like loop, OK, how many times do you want to do? This thing, OK, I'll, I'll explain in, in some time in that. OK. So. What I do is that I now develop a while loop. Basically, I've initialized my node. I've initialized my publisher topic and I have to now do a while loop like it keeps running. It keeps publishing again and again and again. So I say while I can use this. OK, I can use while one. The most simplest way of writing a code, right? But Ross says, why do you want to use while one? There's a, there's a function. OK, there's a function called while. Ross py is shut down. 
this function basically ros py dot s shutdown when you call this function it returns a boolean value say true or false which basically means is my ros master still running if my ros master is running then keep loop keep looping this if my ros master is not running then what am i doing here just exit the code okay instead of doing a while one which is going to run completely for no reason even if there is no ros master or if all of the nodes have shut down and yet my this node is keep run, keeping on running because i've just mentioned while one it doesn't make sense right so ross says i have a function called is shutdown which basically give, tells you if, if if the ross core is still running yes or no so still while the ross core is running what you do is loop four times in a second i have to achieve a rate of four okay just loop four times in one second okay and how do you do that so I use something called as rate dot sleep. So what you've do, done is you've mentioned a variable called rate, and that data structure basically has a function called as sleep. So what it will do is, if if I have to loop four times, then then my looping time for a single loop will be 250 milliseconds as simple as that right in that case if the program which has been written here say i'm doing something here okay and that program is taking say around 100 milliseconds then what rate dot sleep does is that for the next 150 milliseconds it just shuts down the program it just goes to a sleep so it's like if the timeout is achieved then go ahead to perform the next loop or else just stay here and wait till the timeout has is reached you know, as simple as that so this takes care of my uh, frequency of how many times should i publish or should i do something in a loop okay in in a, in a single second so this basically will take care of my looping frequency so what 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 do i what do i actually do in that time so what i do is i basically say i make a string a variable called string which has a value called good night say moon Okay, I'm just creating a string called goodnight moon. I want to publish this string, you know, every one second. Okay, every 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 uh, like four times a second. Okay, so what I do? I have the variable, then I call this publish variable, which actually has the name of the topic, which has the data type and everything set. Okay, I call this publish dot publish. That has a function called as publish inside which I basically pass the string to publish. That's it, this will, this will publish my message <coughs> in chat topic, as simple as that, okay? Now, to actually see if this is getting published or not, or this loop is being running, so what I do is I just print on the terminal, say dot dot, I just print this. <coughs> Okay. After this, uh, Python has a basic thing which is called if name equals main. You know, this is the entry point of Python. This is the entry point. Then try talk a function. If it doesn't happen, just raise an exception. any exception and just print an error okay say some there's some error okay please check your code that's it so if, if talker works fine talker is going to keep looping every time and it is going to keep publishing a data called as goodnight moon every four times a second simple okay so what do i do next i've made my code i've gotten my code ready okay what what do i do next you again go back to the terminal Okay, you go back to the terminal. Okay, and 
you go to the main workspace folder you have to always be in your workspace folder and not inside any of the src folders okay you have to be in the main workspace folder just do catkin underscore make And any other package can call any other package because I am the one who's taking care of the uh, <clears throat> the entire file system, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so I have basically pops up tutorials, and what I do is that there's one more thing which I have to do. Since this is a Python script, I have to make it executable. Okay. I have to make it executable. I make pop sub publish a script an executable file, which basically means that now see any any file which is shown in green in Ubuntu is basically it's an executable file. That is what it is. OK, so I can now execute this from ROS. So what you do is again make can make and then now. Your workspace has made some changes, had included some package like i said this development or this changes is going to be stored in the devil folder okay so if you want your ROS or your terminal to understand these changes what you do is that you source uh sir yeah the screen is not visible okay just a second just a second OK, so is everyone you know, actually able to understand what I'm. Showing here or. Just a second. OK, so I hope everyone is able to understand right now. Can you can everyone see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, OK, yes, sorry. Sir. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah, so like I said. Uh, OK, so what I was saying is that I do catkin make OK and I see for every new package that has been developed. I do catkin make see OK in your workspace. You have two different packages called pops up tutorials, pops up tutorials two, and there can be another package called uh, say joystick. Everything is being taken care of by Ross. You just have to do catkin make every time you make any single change in your package. Do catkin make it will make change. It will adapt to the changes. It will keep a track of all those changes. And what do you do next? OK, all these changes, all these things are being put inside the development folder. OK, so what you have to do is in your terminal after making any development changes, I clearly mentioned development changes. You source devil folder. There's a file called setup dot bash. You just source this the moment you source this, your terminal. OK, this terminal has access to all the packages, all the Python scripts, all the C++ scripts you've written, and you can run those Python files. So how do I run it? There's a simple command called ROS run. Your package name inside which you have that script. Inside that package, you can have 10 different scripts, 100 different scripts. That is OK. A C++ script or Python script, anything you want, but it should have a package. Like I said, it should be enclosed in a package. So I say pops up tutorials is a package name. And again, press tab. It shows me what are the current file which is available to run. So that's the only file for publish script.py. So I try to enter. Okay. So this basically will give me an access to you know, run the entire ROS run. Okay, the script. Okay. So uh yes, so what do we do next? We have we actually have another terminal. OK, so we have a terminal. OK, so. I'm trying to get, get into my. Uh, seminar and workspace, I get into the workspace. OK, and in this workspace, I do catching me. 
to check if there are any changes. There are no changes basically. So I go ahead and I source my bash file development bash dot set up dot bash. Okay. Once I do that, I can now run any Python file or any C script which is present in this publisher subscriber tutorial package and it will show me. Okay. So once I run it, it tells me was okay. I'm ready to run. Okay. This file is ready to run, but there is no master. Okay. There is no one who is actually listening to me. Okay. There's no one who's taking care of my registration that I'm a package who is ready to publish some data. So who, who does this for me? Okay? Who's going to do this for me? I'll have another terminal. Okay. I can run another terminal where I run what is called as ROS core or ROS master. The moment I run ROS core, you can see this has started running. Okay. The moment I run ROS core, ROS starts a new session on my laptop. It takes care of all the TCP connections. It takes care of all the hardware in it. Okay. And it says, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to listen to anyone who is ready to publish, subscribe or initialize something. Do whatever you want. I'm ready. I'm here listening to you guys. Okay. So it basically does what it does is actually establishes a server. So to do to those who are new to complete TCP networking servers and clients, don't worry about this. It's just a server or it's just a place where ROS master says do whatever you want in this place or in this IP. Okay. So now when I run ROS, uh, the publisher script, okay, it see the publisher script says, okay, I've started. I've registered myself to the ROS core and ROS core has every detail about me. Now, as a developer, how do you find that if ROS core has actually, this ROS core has actually got to know about this node or this publisher? So there's something called as ROS node. Okay. This is another command in ROS which can tell you about, which can list, okay, which can list about every node that is available or which can and ping to a node or which can take info about any particular node. So let's do one thing. Let's first do the listing. So I say, come on, list me every node that is available in this PC right now, which is running in this PC. ROS says there are two nodes. One is a ROS out, which is like an inbuilt node of ROS core. Okay, the moment you start ROS core, there's an inbuilt uh, node which is going to uh, work. And the second node is a publisher node. Exact same name which you had given in your script. Okay, so ROS has a track of it. ROS says that you have started a node called publisher node, which has registered itself to me. Okay, with the help of this init node function, and I know that this node is available to be used by anyone, or it is running right now. Okay, in the ROS core. Okay, okay, perfect. There is a ROS node which is running, but what is it publishing? I mean, is it is it giving out some data? Is it listening to some data? Is it publishing? How do I find that? So there's another thing called as ROS topic, okay, which is again takes care of the topics which are available. So what are the different parameters I can use in the ROS topic? So when I press tab, it says you can actually echo, basically meaning you can actually try to find what is it publishing without actually writing another code. Okay, you don't have to write another code to find what this talker is publishing. You can directly just echo into the topic name. So my topic name was chatter, right? Ross master knows it was chatter. So it says, it says there's a chatter topic available. So I use chatter and then I echo. So it gives me the data which was published. Good night moon. That easy. It's that easy. So I don't have to worry about whether this program is going to run in Python, whether this program is going to run in C++ or this library is going to run in whatever language it has been written. I don't care. I just run the program. The program has specific topics in it, which the moment you start the node, okay, the moment you start this node, it is available in ROS code and you can check all those topics. Again, I can also list all the topics which are available to keep an ear to or to subscribe to ROS topic list. And I get chatter is the only topic which is right now being you know, developed or being run by me. This ROS out and ROS AGG is basically ROS core's own topic, which doesn't give you any basic data, like specific data, which you might require. So chatter is the first topic which we did. Perfect. So I have, I can also do this. Okay. I can also find, okay, the info about that topic. So I don't know. Say I say I have a package and I run it blindly. I don't know what kind of a data structure it is publishing. I really don't know because if I want to write a code, 
Okay, then I have to know, right? Is it a string or is it an integer or is it a float? What is it publishing? If I want to write a source scraper, right? So I do ROS topic info chatter. Okay, it gives you an info that this topic, this topic is run by the publisher node. Okay, and the topic has a message type of string, which is a ROS standard message type. So you don't have to worry that will this data type be valid in my python script or will this data type be valid in my c plus plus no you don't have to worry about this is a topic which is called string and it is available so what i do is now we can actually go ahead okay we can actually go ahead and write a subscriber now i won't be wasting time on this because it will take a lot of time then so i just write a sub underscore script dot py okay a python file again which says it is a subscriber script and what do I do in the subscriber script? I basically just copy all course right now here and paste it. Okay. So again, same thing, the same thing which is done in publisher. I import my ROS Python package. I import the string package which is available in ROS PY. Okay. And what I do is ignore this part for a second. Okay. In, so what I do is I initialize the node. Since this again is a program, okay, this again is a individual python program it has to be given a node name okay the moment you start this program it has to be given a node name it, i say it, this is a subscriber node and what i do i say please this subscriber node should subscribe okay this to, should subscribe to a topic called as chatter which is available with ross master ross master has a topic called chatter you as a program or you as a node subscribe to this chatter this chatter has a data type of string okay and any message you're going to get from chatter is going to be a string perfect now there's something called as callback this callback is nothing but this function okay i pass the name of this function to this subscriber function as a parameter what does it do so now just imagine that uh, you are writing a code okay and you really don't know okay you really don't know how many times the publisher is going to publish your data in a second right the frequency how fast or how frequent is the data publishing going to happen so in that case will you actually you know will you actually write a code where you do a while loop and you keep constantly hearing is any data being published yes or no is any data published yes or no you're going to keep on pinging that is called a polling technique which is called a polling technique in coding so you keep constantly keep polling you keep asking hey, any data has been published in chatter so you ask ross master any data published no okay any data published no you don't know right you don't know how many times should i ask so what ross did is ross did a very simple thing it said why why are you doing the polling thing why do you have to come and ask me every time you know what you don't worry okay you just give me the name of the function you just give me the name of the function which you want to call every time a new data is published in chatter so by default any new data any new data if it is published in the chatter topic your callback function directly gets called okay this callback function can have any name you want callback underscore func one like my name like i just have to make sure that i have a callback function in my program with that name callback func one so this callback func one will be called immediately. I have a message in my chatter topic. So you don't have to poll every time on the chatter topic to ask has any data been arrived. Okay. So in the callback, I do a simple thing. Uh, since you're not going to do anything with the data right now, so what I do is I this is the data which is going to arrive. I just log that data. I heard I heard this data. Okay, I heard this data from the chapter topic. That's it. So I run this code. So there's one more thing. So like in the previous script, what I did is since I had to publish, I had to run a while loop, right? But in this code, I'm not doing anything. I don't want to do anything. I I may do something, but right now I don't want to do anything. So what I do that I have an inbuilt function in ROS called spin. So the moment the code starts executing from this line, it says define listener. Okay, I come inside this. I go to ROS init node. Okay, I do that. I do ROS subscriber. Okay, I do that now i don't have anything to loop i don't have anything for the program to be stuck okay to wait so i'll immediately exit i'll immediately exit from you so if you don't want your program to exit ross says okay you don't want to do anything you also don't want to exit because you want to listen to the topic obviously with the help of a callback function so i have a function called as ross py spin 
which keeps this program, this program alive. Okay, it just keeps spinning. It doesn't do anything, it just makes the program stay alive. And the moment there's a data available in the chapter topic, this function is going to be called and you do your data processing here instead of doing anything here. You just do your data processing here as simple as that. So let's go ahead. OK, let's go ahead and. Run this program, OK, so why do I. Go ahead, I go to Samina, I go to my. Workspace, OK, so I list I have the uh, <clears throat> SRZ. I do a cat clinic again. OK, and also I have to change the mode OK, as executable of that file. So. Clash. Clash. So see. So I make this executable now. This code which is already running, which has already registered itself to my Rosco is publishing something which I have to listen from another program, which is nothing but Ross run. Pops up. OK, I have to source my devil, like I said, every time you open a new terminal, OK, every time you open a new terminal, you have to source your development, OK? Until unless your raw score doesn't know there's some development being done by you. So you specifically source your development. And once you source it, you have the scripts, OK? Under pops up tutorials, OK? I have two scripts, which is subscript Python and publisher script Python. I'm already running the publisher script Python, so I'll go ahead with the subscription script Python script and I run it. And you can see this data which is being published here is heard here as well. I hear good night moon. I hear good night moon. That is the frequency. Okay. It's as simple as that. So anytime you want to make a program which does a particular work, on a robotic application. You have another program which does another work, but your other program has dependency with the first program. It wants some data from the first program. You make sure that you write your code in the, in the first program and you publish that data and you make sure that you subscribe to that data in your second code. You can keep doing whatever you want in the while loop in the second code and you can add a callback function. The moment you get the data, you just go to the callback function, you extract the data, you try to find something from the data and you come back to the while loop and you do something else simple. It's as simple as that. So one more thing I can show you there is something called as Ross topic. Uh, hertz, which basically tells you how many times is the chatter topic publishing data, like what is the frequency? So when I do that. It says. Four. Like the average rate is four hertz. It is like 250 milliseconds is the timeout for a single loop, which actually we have mentioned in the code, right? It's as simple as that. Now, to cover one last thing, which uh, again is the cross platform. Like I said, you can have one Python script, one C script as well. You don't have to worry about will my C have to import my Python file? Like, do I have to import? or include hash, include Python script, which is not possible in a C++. How do I do? How do I just pass the data? Data is the only thing which has to be passed or like when you when you actually import a library, what do you do? Do you basically import a function, right? And you get you want to pass some data to that function and you want to get some data from that function, which Ross says you don't have to do it from a function level, but you, have to, you can do it from a node level, right? With the help of topics. So now what I do is I go ahead in here, I make another uh, file which is called as uh, it's called as sub underscore script dot C plus plus. Okay, it's a C plus plus file. So let's see if a C plus plus file can get data from a Python file. Okay, is it possible? Yes, obviously it is. So I go here. I already have the code with me, so I won't waste time much. So is exactly the same like your Python script, if you can see. So I include my ROS header. I include my string message file, OK, which is a standard data type of ROS. Then I have a callback function for the chatter. I in the in the main in the main I initialize my ROS node with the same listener node name. I 
hand i mean can handle the now again there are some changes in your python and in your c++ so there is something called as node handle object which takes care of your node okay and in that node i do a subscriber which subscribes to chatter with the chatter callback function being called okay and i do raw spin just spin don't do anything don't do a while loop nothing just keep the program from exiting okay that's it i do this and this one thing which i have to do is make some changes in my c make list okay and we're done so i go ahead again i do catkin make in my main workspace the main workspace identifies that there is another script called as c++ script subscript c++ which is being added so i have to make an executable file an object file for it and i'll compile it and i'll get it ready so it's done so it is ready for me so now again if i source my development since i've added something new i source my development again and i can find that i have the pops up tutorials and inside which i have three scripts two python scripts as you can see and one c++ executable okay so i run the c++ executable so this code is completely written in c++ and yet it can give you the same data which is being published by a python script now how many of you can think of this as a very easy way of integrating different programming codes or different programming applications written in different languages and just integrating it into your ros okay you don't have to worry about the cross platform the importing something importing a new library you don't have to worry about it. you just import everything as a package you import a package you listen to a particular topic you get the particular data simple as that that's how simple robot operating system becomes now this was just a part from the programming perspective right so to complete this or to end this uh, seminar i'll be showing you a package okay a package which is already been developed by ros which is like the hello world like like a hello, hello world script of any language right so it's like it's like that to make you understand what ros is so let's go ahead and do that we will have cross run okay package name is called as turtle sim okay it's called as turtle sim okay this is a package okay it's it's a it's a, it's a basically of a robot called as turtle robot which uh, ross actually when they started development of ross they went ahead with the robot called as turtle robot and if you can see every distribution of ross is based is based on a turtle that that's how that's the concept of it okay so this is ross and turtle sim and turtle sim has four different scripts a draw square script a mimic a turtle sim node and a turtle tell key so i'll do what i'll do is i'll run the turtle sim underscore node and this will turn on okay a window a simple window which has a turtle robot in it now this turtle robot you know can actually move in this entire arena but how do you make it move okay this turtle sim node does only one job okay this program this program or this node does only one job listen to some data of where i have to go and move the robot that's it okay that's the only thing it does so let me start another node okay let me start another node inside the turtle sim package itself which gives me an option to give commands give commands to that robot so this turtle tell you of key if you can see turtle tell you of key is basically a package which takes care of your keyboard okay it gets input from your keyboard and publishes data to the turtle sim node and says boss someone has pressed the up arrow go up or someone has pressed the left arrow go left so, so it says you know use your arrow keys to move the turtle so let let us get this in front and i'll have this view here okay so if i press the up arrow it goes up if i press the left it goes left if i press the right it goes right 
so this is being so this node okay this node here is listening to my keyboard values and this node here gets the data from this node over topics okay over topics i'll show you what are the topics which are available i'll show you what are the topics it gets and the topics which are available and it says okay this node has passed me a data of going up so i'll go up so that is what it does and also if i reach the boundaries okay if i reach the boundaries of this it actually tells me that you know what you have reached the maximum position okay i oh no i've hit the wall okay so this is again like a feature of robotics right if you want to do uh, an autonomous motion then taking care of the walls taking care of the obstacles are like one main thing right so this is like basically saying oh i've hit the wall you know take care so what are the topics what are the topics by which these two nodes are basically communication communicating so i do a ross topic list and i find that there's something called as turtle one command velocity there's something called as turtle one color sensor there's something called as turtle one post these three are the topics over which this node publishes data and this node listens to it's as simple as that okay i can also do one more thing i can also run another script which is called as draw square script and what it does is basically makes the robot move in square so this thing is publishing data to this node and saying please you know make it move in a square so what are the what is the relevant data it is publishing let's see your cross topic echo third one let's say i'm using the post data so this is the data as you can see very well i'll just zoom in for you if you can see this is the exact data the x the y where it, it has to go basically this x y will be nothing but your coordinates of the square right like the edges of the square okay theta what should be the angle at which it should rotate to it should it rotate to 0 90 just look at my cursor if you want 0 90 180 270 or come back to 360 or which is again 0 so that theta is being given here okay and the linear velocity how fast do you want the robot to move like how many mm or how many pixels per second do you want the robot to move that is the linear velocity and angular velocity linear velocity and angular velocity are the most important part or concepts of your robotics which any robot any robot in the world should have right so any any moving robot will have concept of linear velocity like how fast do you want the robot to move in x y direction and how fast do you want to rotate the robot around a particular axis angular velocity for this robot there's only one axis around which the z axis around which it will rotate okay so there's only one axis which i'm giving so now to show you in a nutshell ross has even data structures so if you can see x is a float y is a float again theta is in radians which is a float linear velocity which is a float angular velocity which is a float what i'm doing is that i am clubbing five float values in a single structure which is already been given by ross as a standard package it also gives you standard packages for structures it says boss uh, if if your if your robot uh, has to publish data about something like a position or something like a velocity then I have a structure for velocity okay ross uh, standard message velocity if you want to uh, message some uh, if you want to share some data like uh position then i have a uh, data structure called post post basically will have three things x y theta or in a 3d in case of a 3d it will have x y z and theta 1 theta 2 theta 3 in three dimensional so all these are also mentioned as basic data structures in ross which are already there you just have to import that particular message type over here okay over here and you have to fill the data in that particular data type simple as that so this was just one again simple you know simulation so if you can see this is actually a simulation okay this is actually a simulation a 2d simulation if you can say in the same way you can have something like a 3d simulation which is a very vast topic again which is men uh, taken care of by ross gazebo and ross simulation okay 
the other simulation package. So yes, uh, I think that's it for today. Like we had some practical uh, knowledge as well. So to conclude this lecture, so I can show you something called as Ross Wiki, which is like the to go uh, you know website for having to learn tutorials, introduction, anything, anything which you want about Ross. Okay, you can find it in Ross Wiki. Okay, the moment you open Ross, I can actually show you here. The moment you open Ross Wiki, you get every single documentation about introduction, installation, getting started, tutorials. You can actually have the tutorial which I showed you right now. Okay about how do you set up your environment how do you set up ROS file system what is a package understanding different nodes topics how do you write a code okay how do you write a simple publisher subscriber for c plus plus how do you write a simple publisher subscriber for python everything everything is mentioned here in this tutorials and you can this is like an intermediate level the final level of ROS where you can have a lot of other packages so, which you can learn like visualization, modeling, everything. So this everything is being given by Ross under the Ross Wiki, okay, the documentation page, and you can actually go ahead and search for whatever you want. And like I said, you can also have the different robots, okay, the different robots which are supported by Ross. So if you actually go ahead, you go ahead and buy say a robot called TurtleBot 3. So this is the first robot, this Turtle Sim is basically nothing but this TurtleBot robot in a 2D environment, OK? So if you want to buy TurtleBot 2 or 3 or any version of TurtleBot, you don't have to worry. You just buy TurtleBot, OK? You directly go ahead in ROS, download all the packages given by TurtleBot 3 people, the developers of TurtleBot 3, just install those packages. You learn the core concepts of robots. Which, what, is, what is that? You learn slam techniques, you learn navigation, you learn path planning, you learn image processing. You don't have to worry about what is the hardware which sits in this because the hardware is taken care of by the ROS developers. OK, your motive is to learn, right? So you go ahead, you buy this robot or if you don't want to buy this robot, just go ahead in ROS, install all the packages of TurtleBot 3 and there's something called as TurtleBot simulation. You just have to run the simulation and it will show you the entire simulation of this TurtleBot. It's as simple as that. You don't actually have to sit and worry about, hey, how do I get the hardware? How do I make this robot? Will this robot run? How do I you know, integrate the firmware of this robot with my software, which I'm going to learn? No, you don't have to worry about that. So you can actually go search different categories of robot, say manipulators, and you can find all the robots, all the robots around the world, which are being manufactured by different vendors in the industry which have support in ROS or which are basically developed in ROS. So you just have to go and you know, install all those packages one by one. These are some robot manipulators. OK, you know, if you want to say Arial, OK, if you want to go Arial, then these are some companies which have their <clears throat> ROS uh, packages given to you. So you can actually go ahead and use those ROS packages and you can make the same exact drone which they have made OK, by yourself with having some tweaks or having some changes or having some things taken out so you, you can make whatever you want okay that's how simple it is you just have to install the packages ross install i mean sorry sudo app get installed ross noetic ross melodic whatever is of distribution hyphen the package name which is provided by the vendor it's as simple by as that so if i, if I check total about two i can show you give some videos and uh, And these are the packages, okay? These are the packages in GitHub which TurtleBot 2 has given, okay? You can also get the same package in ROS if you want. If you go to the ROS website itself, they will give you the same packages, okay? And uh, yes, I think that's it for today from myself. And a final video, okay? Which will show you whatever I have talked to you about in a nutshell. Just a second.
so like you can see here in this one uh sorry sorry so i you don't actually have to have an entire robot so this is a cobot arm okay this is developed by universal robot this is a cobot arm okay now this actually costs around 6 to 8 lakhs okay if you want to buy it so but yet you want to learn you want to learn what a cobot arm does and how do you operate it you want to learn about it how do you do that a cobot arm actually they have given you a ros package a simulation package which you can see here to how to run that so you just have to import the simulation package and you don't have to worry about what is the hardware in the robot you can go ahead and learn inverse kinematics you can go ahead and learn forward kinematics you can develop your own codes to make the robot move from position a to position b rotate you know linearly uh, move it rotate it however whatever you want to do you can do that you also have uh, the apis the packages which <clears throat> Uh, are inbuilt with cobot arm which you can directly use to say move from point a to point b it will show you how does it move it will show you in the simulation how it actually moves so you can then develop your own codes and you can actually learn how a robot arm works you don't have to worry about the hardware you don't have to worry about where do i sit in code where do i sit in write my codes how do i join it no you open a ros workspace you create a package you import cobot arm package you create your own codes just run it just hit the right topics just subscribe and publish to the right topics to get and publish the right data simple as that okay Mm, yeah so that's it that's it from my side for today i hope you all had a very good time you know trying to understand what i've actually shown you guys i think it was a lot of things which uh, i have actually uh, shown you guys together but i think some things you might learn only when you try to start you know working on ros on a on a, on a daily basis or on a better way so i think it's not something which you can learn in a single day but it will take a lot of time maybe 6 months or 4 months or 5 months depending on how fast how pace you know your learning curve is okay so do not do not worry about any uh, jumping into the field of robotics of not understanding what a robot is of not understanding what any hardware is you just try to find any robot which amuses you try to find if ross has a package of that robot try to write codes to simulate any particular robot and try to see what happens you know that's how simple it is 
and that's how then you can actually start learning different concepts of robotics and then switch to the hardware part as well. OK, so thank you. Thank you everyone for uh, giving me an opportunity to present this and I had a very good time. OK, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, um, Abhinav, yeah. for uh, coming and uh, giving the lecture. It is it was really nice, but uh, I could I missed in between. I will see the video and then uh, learn. Sure. I wanted sure. to learn yes. actually. We had another meeting also in the college, so I missed some okay. of the topics. But, uh, yeah, sure, sure. it was no really problem. nice, and it you opened a new world to me also actually. Uh, I was thinking of learning ROS since so many days. It was okay. really nice and students. I don't yeah, know how much yeah, sure. they understood at least my students, but others uh, uh, other students are really interested and they joined. I think because of that. Only. OK, it's a really nice. Okay. I think thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, thank, sure. I'm sure I think uh, uh, I mean they can actually get into Ross. Anyone who wants to learn Ross just go into the Ross community and we can have everything you know, written there. You don't have to actually wait for someone to teach you. you thousands of videos and how ROS works. So don't waste time if you really want to get into robotics. Just go ahead and start learning because this is the age. I mean, every robot being developed today is developed in ROS. So make sure you are there in that field. Uh, that so, application yeah, you so had shown, I have seen in some of the simulations also. There are some uh, uh, simulations available for this uh, uh, this type yeah, of so uh, robot. I did want to show. Yeah, so I did want to show some simulations as well, but uh, there are some limitations with me right now. So because the laptop I'm using, so yeah, 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 maybe yeah, next time yeah. if I get an opportunity, I'll surely have a better version yeah, yeah. and I can actually show you guys everything. Yeah. OK, nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the opportunity Thank and you. have a nice day. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, yeah. Abhinav. Today you have taken out yeah. time and uh, three hours almost. You were continuously speaking. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually wanted to make it more interactive, <laughs> but I didn't think people actually, you know, <laughs> talk in, in the seminar. But that's okay. So, yeah. Many uh, long lectures of hours now. So now we have a chance to attend his lecture. <laughs> yeah, 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 I can understand that. OK. So uh, can we conclude this now? Uh, thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful uh, session. It helped me a lot to understand uh, the overview of robotics and ROS. Um, I'm personally okay. intrigued by it and would really like to learn about this domain more. Uh, thank you for your time and enlightening us with your knowledge. OK, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, can everyone please on the camera uh, so we can take a photo? Do you want me to turn on mine as well? Yes, and uh, yes, participants and. Uh... Yes. And done, ma'am. Done. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, all the faculty members and participants for being a part and making it an interactive event. I would like to request all the participants to feel the feedback form. Uh, thank you and st uh, stay safe. And stay tuned for our next event. Thank you, sir.
Uh, link for the feedback form is in chat. Uh, The same link will be posted on the WhatsApp group as well. So uh, if you miss it here, you can get it on WhatsApp group as well. Thank you all. Uh, so everyone can leave the meeting. Right. You can end the meeting then. That is better. Okay, ma'am. Gaurav can end the meeting if Gaurav is controlling.